live. Good morning, South Park. Everyone that is in quarantine right now, if you're at home watching us over live stream, I want to say hello. Thank you for joining us. Listen, we've got a very, very Certainly good. Now you good. Start over again. Are oh, you good? All right. Good morning, everybody that is joining us on live stream. We want to say hello. Welcome to South Park. Thank you for joining us this morning. We've got a very, very special service ahead today. Um, we're so looking forward to worship, and we are hoping to introduce a new pastor today. You're going to hear from Chad Bertrand, and we're going to be voting on him after church today. So thank you so much for everyone who's going to be uh, participating in that vote online for all the members. We want to say be sure to do that by Monday afternoon. That's when the, the polls are closing, okay? Uh, Mike, the leader of the search team, is going to be talking about how to vote at the end of service today. So make sure you stay tuned in for all of that in its duration. Again, thanks for joining us, and I want to give a quick shout out to my friend Lee over at Heights. He texted us this morning, said Heights, our sister church here in town. They're praying for us. We appreciate that. And we're ready to keep working for the kingdom. So we're going to be starting service here in just a few, and we'll see you in there. There we go. All right. We're good. Thanks, guys.
trying to feel the same old holes inside, there's a better life, there's a better life, you got pain. You ever get some folks that request a song and they just badger you and badger you about it until you did? Thank you, Richard. Y'all can thank Richard for that. <laughs> Sorry, got a little bit of transition here. We want to take a minute to highlight a very special group of people. Two and a half years ago as a church body, we nominated seven people to represent us in our search for a new pastor. The result of that was a diverse group of individuals who have been faithful to this church for a very long time. And y'all, they represent us well, our spiritual ideals and values as a church. So I'm gonna call those members up. If you're here, if you would please come up here to the front step and you know, space out six feet apart. We wanna recognize you guys this morning. We're gonna go ladies first, okay? The first one I wanna welcome up is Miss Jean Barrow. Miss Jean has been a member here for three and a half decades. That's about as long as I've been alive. Over the years, she has taught youth Sunday school, team kid, and in the nursery, vacation Bible schools over the years, and is one of our fearless leaders of Beach Club and Ignite. She has served on finance, youth, personnel, building, and hospitality committees. <sighs> and on top of all that, she's all around one of the sweetest people you'll ever meet. Let's hear it for Miss Jean. 
Next one is Miss Belle Sanchez. Miss Belle has also been a member for three and a half decades. She has taught Sunday school for over 20 of those years and has also served on personnel committee. If you know her, you know she is a shining light, a staple in our community, so much so that if you head down to Rose Sharon, you'll find a new elementary school named after her. They don't do that for just anybody, y'all. Let's hear it from Miss Bell. <laughs> Next one is Dr. Shandar Hobbs. <laughs> Dr. Shandar. <laughs> you aren't a girl. We got to use that. Dr. Shandar was born in this church right over there and has never moved pews. <laughs> she has been a member at South Park for over 25 of her years. She served on the personnel committee, has taught Sunday school as a lifeguard for Beach Club, and currently serves as the director of children's Sunday school. And one day, this is my prophetic moment here, one day there will be a school named after Shandar. You'll probably just have to serve in that superintendent chair for a little while first, but you're going to get there, girl. All right. These are just three of them, but Chad, let me tell you, we've got a big number of fine, high caliber ladies in this church. Then we have some wonderful women in this church that are some godly leaders and examples. And then we got the dudes. Here they are. The first one is a proud new grandpa, Mr. Tony Robinson. He's been a member for about 33 years. He has served on every committee several times. That's the way he worded it. If you're good at something, just going to keep on making you do it, man. He has taught Sunday school from second grade all the way to senior adults and is a group leader for Beach Club and Ignite since it started. He also serves weekly with Meals on Wheels and has been a deacon for the past 16 years. Brother, I'm tired just from reading all that. All right. Great servant. Let's hear it for Tony. And then next is uh, Robert Hassey. He's been a member here for about 36 years, even though he told me he's only about 37. And he grew up in this church, and he was saved here at eight years old. And like his brother-in-law in front of us, um, he's been a Sunday school teacher for all age groups, from first graders to senior adults. I was very, very fortunate to have Robert teach youth Sunday school for a few years when I first came on board here. So he was there to hold my hand, and I could cry on his big shoulder over some things. He currently co-teaches a Sunday school class for a group of old guys, and he is the chairman of the deacons this year, also involved in the worship team, and he told me I can't think of a committee I haven't been on. All right, let's hear it for Robert. If y'all can imagine, my very first meeting here at South Park with Pastor Howard was like a Monday morning, and then these two guys walk in. I, was, I told Howard, I said, my word, y'all growing big here. What's in the water? Then, of course, there is David Griffith. He is joining us on live stream today. Who put that? <laughs> of all the pictures I told David to send me, he chose our prom picture. That was Easter, two Easter's ago. He insisted on it. I've had the privilege of knowing this guy since he was a senior in high school. I just, I think so highly of this young man. And uh, once he came back from Aggieland, he has served in children's ministry and youth ministry. He's been at South Park for 16 years. And you know, uh, a lot of you just over the past eight months, he went from a single guy to a married father of three now. He's got two on the ground and one on the way. Um, so thank you so much, David, joining this live stream. We appreciate you, brother. Last but certainly not least is the head of this team, Brother Mike Fontenot. And all these folks that you see up here have been serving a life sentence here at South Park, but he's only been a member here for 13 years, and that's because he hails from Louisiana, but we forgave him of that a long time ago. Over the years, he has taught Team Kid on Wednesday nights, was an RA leader before that. Probably my first three youth camps um, I dragged him and Amy in as leaders for those weeks, so I know firsthand just how patient this man is, not just with teenagers, but with me. I was a brash young youth pastor back in my 20s, not the distinguished individual you see in front of you today. So I got a lot of respect for this guy. I always have. Mike, we appreciate you. He's a great servant here. He has been serving as a deacon for the past few years, also 
served on finance and personnel committees, and you can often find him on Sunday mornings greeting people and working security in the parking lot. Let's hear it for Mike. So y'all, I just wanted to take a moment to share their quote-unquote credentials just to remind you, we didn't have the JV team running the show here. What you're looking at before you today are some standouts who have shown their dedication to the Lord and his church time and time and time again. And they have labored in blood, sweat, and tears behind the scenes week in and week out for about the past 30 months. Y'all heard me right. 30 months. We felt it's important for you guys to get a visual reminder this morning of who God has used to pave the way for our church's future. Pastor Serge team, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Let's hear it for them one more time. And then Ryan is my oldest daughter, and then Sawyer, and Della. Can you stand up, Della? Stand up. Turn around. There we go. Thank you. You're going to need to introduce them for two reasons. I love them, and I'm about to tell stories about them. And so it's good if you know them before I tell you about them. Uh, but before we get started, let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are a God who is in control. You are a God 
who wants what's best for us as individuals and wants what's best for uh, South Park Baptist Church. We thank you for uh, being faithful in the past, and that lets us know that you will continue to be faithful in the days to come. So Lord, now as we look at your word, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We all love in different ways, don't we? Uh, to exemplify this, we were sitting at dinner with my parents last weekend was Father's Day. So it was a good Father's Day dinner. And so Lori decides to ask the kids, what do you love the most about granddad? And their answer was, he gives us a hard time. Which is true. That is probably the primary way that you know my dad really loves you. He's got this wonderful, dry sense of humor. If he's not picking on you, you should start being worried. Because you know, if he's not picking on me, does he really love me? And so, because Granddad gives us a hard time, we know Granddad loves us. He also makes great bacon and eggs for breakfast. He lets David mow his yard. There's other ways Granddad shows his love, too. But that's probably the primary way. And so then Lori says, well, how do you know that Daddy loves you? What's your favorite way that Daddy shows you his love? And they said, because he's silly. And that's kind of true, right? When we love somebody, we let our guard down. We, we let our full selves out. Uh, we show our love by being ourselves with one another. Now, Matt, I see that face. You're thinking, I've got some videos I can make Chad make. Be careful. Um, <laughs> I see what's turning in your eyes. Uh, but that's how we show love, isn't it? Um, and then one more, because it's, it, it's a joy every time I leave the house. There's this little one, Della. When anybody's leaving the house, she comes running, and she says, hug, 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 hug. And she's not letting you out that door unless she wraps her arms around your leg and holds on tight for a little while. It's the way she shows that she loves. We all have different ways of showing that we love. We've got to be a little bit careful with this because we have a world that takes love and we have broadened it into just about anything and everything, haven't we? To where we don't really know a distinction. We can love our favorite pen. We can love what we had for dinner last night. We can love the movie that just came out. And we think everybody else should love those things as well. And so we have so diluted the term love. Not only that, we've used it as a magic stamp, haven't we? If we just put love on it, then it makes everything okay. And I want to say that this morning is the church... We need to see that there is a difference between the way our world loves and the difference between the way that church should love. Well, we find it in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And Jesus is on the night that he is going to be betrayed. And he says to his disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. By this, uh, as I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this all people to know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so it begs the question, what are you known for? It makes me ask the question, what am I known for? It asks you as an individual, what are you known for? As a collective church body, South Park Baptist Church, what are you known for? John 13, in Jesus' words, he says we should be, we must be known for our love, a love that is different, a love that stands out, a love that makes people scratch their heads and say, there is something strange about the way that person loves. It's not normal. It's not the way everybody else does it. We need to love differently. So how can we love in a way that makes the world say that is different than what we have? That's different than the way we love. There's one simple answer to that, Jesus. Jesus is the only way that we can love the way that will stand out in this world. I mean, that passage says, As I have loved you, you must also love one another. I mean, Jesus is on his way to the cross at this point, isn't he? He's about to show the world the greatest act of love it has ever seen. Jesus is about to die for our sins, take our place. Not only that, he's the one we've sinned against. We have said we want to go our way instead of your way. And that's brought sin into this world. So the one who is injured is the one who's going to take the place for us. This is love. 
He says, just as I have loved, just as I have done these things, I want you too to love in these ways. We can love because of the way Jesus has loved. And that will make us look different in the world. Because Jesus' death on the cross not only saves us, but it changes us. He he didn't just die, he rose again to life so that we could have a new and different life now. And it's because of his salvation in our lives that we are able to love the way that he loves in this world. He brings about love for us. Which means if we're going to love the way that he loves, we need to let him define love for us, don't we? There's a lot of places we can go in scripture to see how love is defined. But I think probably the most famous, the most recognizable is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I mean, we've nicknamed it the love chapter after all, haven't we? Immediately, how many of you thought of a wedding? Anybody? Right? And this is good, right? This helps me love Lori better. It helps me love my kids better. This is good for us in relationship with each other. But this wasn't written for a wedding. This was written for the church. The church in Corinth, uh, they, they had a problem with love. They weren't on the track that they needed to be on. Actually, if you read the rest of 1 Corinthians up to this point, you'll find out that there's divisions among them. There are cliques that have formed. You find that some people are trying to use their God-given gifts and abilities, the things that God has given them for the building up of the church, but instead they're using them for the building up of their own reputation and their own selves. You see that there are people who are inventing new ways to sin, that it seems like their goal is just to make the Roman world around them blush. And not to mention, they've got some kind of disorderly, crazy worship thing going on. And Paul's addressing each of these things, and then he gets to chapter 13, and it's kind of like he's changing direction. It kind of seems like it's standing out. Maybe he's just giving us this beautiful poem to give us a break from all this berating and teaching that's going on. But I think actually if we dig into 1 Corinthians 13, what we find is that this isn't a break. This is the climax. And this beautiful poetic language deep down is convicting, at least to me, on how we should love, what we should be like as the church. So 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1 says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have all prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. I think it's probably pretty easy to summarize this, isn't it? Without love, everything else doesn't matter. David Garland puts it this way. He says here, Paul reminds the Corinthians that love, not spiritual gifts, is the marrow of their Christian existence. It's the center of everything for us. It's the heart of everything for the church. Without love, nothing else matters. So for the church in Corinth, tongue seems to be this gift that they're holding up to be the special thing. They're using it to try to draw other people in. And Paul's saying, this gift that you are holding up, it has no merit, it has no benefit if love is not behind it. Now, we probably don't have many conversations about tongues in the Baptist church today, do we? But I think something that we tend to do is we want to come up with these creative ways to draw people in to the church. Well, what can we do to attract more people here? And we can come up with these great ideas, we can use our gifts, we can use our creativity. But the thing that's really attractive, the thing that really brings people to church, is love. Not just love, but God's love. Because love is attractive. Jesus is attractive. Jesus is the most attractive thing that the church has to offer. And so we can be creative, we can come up with ideas, but if we don't let love be the thing that attracts people in then all of those things are ultimately for nothing. Next, probably speaking straight to my heart at least, it says we can 
have the gift of prophecy. We can speak on God's behalf. We can understand mysteries. We can understand God's word. We can dig into scripture. We can know this book incredibly well. But if we don't have love, it's really pointless. I can get up here and preach, but if I don't love, it means nothing. So when I was early on in ministry, uh, which was 20 years ago, thanks Mike for pointing that out, I don't feel that old, but um, I was probably preaching my second or third sermon. I was working in college ministry at a church, I got a chance to preach, and my dad gave me this piece of advice before I preached that week. He called me on the phone, he said, Chad, if you have something difficult to say to the church, make sure you love them first. If you don't love them first, don't say it. Make sure you love them first. And it's true, right? If we have a word to speak, and if we have a word that needs to be heard, we need to love the people we're sharing it with. Lori was running yesterday morning, and she was listening to Ravi Zacharias. She's been doing that a lot lately. And she came across this quote in one of his sermons, so she pointed me to it. She knew what I was preaching on this morning. In this sermon, he said, convictions ungirded. Now, this is careful for English majors in the room. Ungirded, not undergirded. So it's not has love, it's not with love. So convictions ungirded by love will make the possessor of those convictions obnoxious. And the dogma he or she possesses will become repulsive. In other words, what he's saying is if love's not underneath it all, the convictions we have just seem obnoxious to the world around us. If there's not love underneath what we say, then even the gospel that we proclaim will become repulsive, not attractive. So when we share the gospel, which is this great story of love, we need to do it in a loving way. It seems to make sense, right? But sometimes, sometimes we don't always think about it. And so Paul says, without love... We really have nothing. Nothing gets a pass here, by the way. Faith doesn't get a pass. Generosity doesn't get a pass. Even martyrdom doesn't get a pass. If love is not at the foundation of it, Paul says it's ultimately meaningless. Faith makes sense a little bit, right? So how can we have faith on a loving God and not be loving ourselves? Uh, but then the thing that really started hitting home to me is generosity. Because I think we can walk this line probably more than any of the other ones. I can go do something nice for somebody. I can go take care of somebody. Here in 1 Corinthians 13, this translation says, I can give away all my possessions. Another equal way to translate that is, I can give away morsels of food bit by bit. Either way, if I'm going to feed somebody, or if I'm going to give away things that I have to somebody, I can feel good about myself for doing a good deed without ever loving the person that I've done it for. It really was highlighted for me um, one year while I was in seminary. We were poor seminary students, and so we lived in the ghetto of Waco because it was the cheapest place we could find. Um, we knew going in, but we didn't realize the impact it would have. But our backdoor neighbor was the largest house of, shall we say, undesirable activity in Waco. Uh, they sold all kinds of goods back there and used our street corner to do it. Um, our, street, our house was a backdrop of sting operations many times on the news. It's a proud day uh, when that happens. Lots of stories uh, from that year of life. But we had one rule. I don't remember which of my roommates came up with it, but it wasn't me. Uh, they said, no matter what, we will always have peanut butter and jelly and bread in this house. And no matter what, if somebody comes to our door, whatever time of day or night it is, if you answer the door and somebody's hungry, you go and make them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you take it back out to them, and give them food to eat. That was the rule. And so many days, that's all we did, right? And it's sometimes you go in, make your peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and you're begrudging the fact that you were in the middle of studying for something, or you had other things you were planning on doing, or you were about to leave, and it's really an inconvenient time. But one day... Uh, Two guys came to the door. I was the only one home. And one guy was obviously showing the other guy where all the places he could get food were. He was obviously new to the streets. He didn't know the ways of the streets yet. And you could see, you could see the shame in his face. He hadn't grown callous 
to asking for things yet. So I went in and made the sandwich, and, and the whole time I was like, what can I do? What can I do so that he doesn't feel bad about having to ask for food? What can I do to make him feel loved today? And, and the only thing I could think of is I'll just go sit with him. I'll go take this sandwich out to these two guys and give one to each of them. I say, hey, why don't you sit underneath our tree? Let's just let's sit and talk for a while. Let me hear more about who you are, much of your stories you're willing to share with me. You see, it's easy to make a sandwich for somebody. It's a whole lot harder to take the time to love somebody. Often when we think about doing things for others, we kind of put ourselves in separate categories. But what that experience that day made me realize is that I'm not the one that needs to do something for you. Instead, I need to realize that we're brothers and sisters that are willing to do whatever it takes for each other. And I don't need to just provide for your physical needs, but your spiritual and emotional needs as well. And I need you in my life too. This isn't a one-way relationship. Love's not a one-way relationship. We need one another. And it changes our mindset. It changes our motivation. It changes the way we love and minister with each other. The last one that Paul addresses here is martyrdom. If you're even willing to give up your life, but it's not for love, then you've really given up your life for nothing. Paul is driving the point home, isn't he? Our motive ultimately matters. Love must be at the center of everything. And this really shouldn't surprise us, should it? Because this is what Jesus taught us. We go back to Matthew chapter 22. Jesus is being challenged, in this case, by the Pharisees. And they're asking him what the greatest commandment is. What is central? What's the most important thing? Matthew 22, verse 34, he says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had been silenced by the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest, great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so from these words, we find that love is central for us. And we are to love God with all that we are. Nothing is left out, even with all of our potential, we are to love God. And we are also, in turn, to love one another. Nobody is left out. We are to love every single person. Love should be central. This is foundational for us as believers. And the Corinthian church was having a problem with this, weren't they? <laughs> but where the Corinthian church had a deficit of love, y'all excel in love. So when I tried to figure out what your reputation was, what are you known for, South Park Baptist Church? Love is the thing that came over and over again. Love is the thing that really drew Lori and I to come here and be here today. From the first conversation I had with Mike Fontenot on the phone, he told me about his first Sunday here from Louisiana. Good Louisiana last name, but no, I have a good Louisiana last name, Bertrand. Uh, my dad grew up in South Louisiana, moved to Houston, which is where we're ultimately from. And so from Louisiana, came to Texas, moved to Alvin, looking for a new church. And he said from the moment he stepped foot in this church, you started treating him like family. That's a big deal. That's a huge thing. So much so that you trusted him with this whole process. 10, 13, some odd years later. That's love in action. Not only that, when Lori and I came and interviewed with the search committee, y'all had snacks, which is awesome, by the way. That's a great way uh, to have an interview. But you didn't just have snacks, but you insisted that we take them home to our kids. Uh, everything that was left over. And man, the next morning when they woke up and there was all this fresh fruit on the table, I mean, they were over the moon ecstatic. They said, well, I don't know what meeting y'all went to last night, but y'all need to go to that meeting again. We, we want that meeting. Um, 
I mean, you have a heritage of love in this place. I, I heard that uh, Don Piper, 90 Minutes in Heaven, was the youth minister here. So I went and got the book, and uh, I was struck by the amount of just sacrificial, never-ending love that this church poured out to him and his family during that time. I mean, you have a heritage of love in this place. And Brother Al, Matt, they, they told me again this week as we had conversations that this is a loving church. And, and Matt did y'all well this morning. He had a cup of coffee waiting for me on my desk. I mean, he made sure to, to show y'all's hospitality and love today. So where do we go from here? We'll keep doing it, right? Uh, love is not something we're done with. Love is something we continue on in our lives. And so for me, a practice that I've had from time to time in my life is I've read the next few verses of this passage, 1 Corinthians 4 through 8. Uh, I've ended my day with that. And and as I end my day with those verses, I'll use it as a reflection time. In what ways has God used my life to love well? In what ways has he worked through me to love in ways that I would never have been able to love myself? And then in what ways have I failed to love? What ways have I fallen short of loving? In what ways do I still need the sanctification of God working in my life to be a more loving person? And before we look at that passage, there's just a few of these terms. They're really all self-explanatory. But given our day and our time and the culture we live in, there's a few that I want to make sure that we think about. And then I want us to go through that same exercise with one another. The first one is love is not irritable. It's not easily irritated. I've got a twin brother, and so many times in my growing up years, uh, it would be, Mom, Brad's irritating me, or Brad's bugging me. And I would hear these words from my mom. Chad, you're choosing to be irritated. You get to choose how you respond to your brother. Well, yeah, but he's doing things that make it easier to be irritated. But love means we do choose how we respond differently. We choose not to be irritated as much. And so you've probably spent a lot more time with your family than you usually do. Remember, love is not easily irritated. How we respond does matter. And love also doesn't do things that irritate others as well. We can have both sides of this coin, right? Also, love is not resentful. Love doesn't keep record of wrongs. We we don't keep a tally sheet of those we need to get back on. No, we are told we need to love our enemies. We bless those who curse us. So we are not people who harbor grudges. We are people who harbor love. In in an increasingly polarized society, we need to remember that we are people who don't hold things against other people. And the last one is love rejoices in the truth. And oftentimes we separate truth and love, but Scripture says we must hold those together. Because the truth is, if my kids run into the street and there's a car coming, it's not going to be good, right? So what do I do? I tell my kids not to run in the street. If they're headed to the street, I yell and say, stop, don't go into the street. And if they have this propensity to continue going to the street, then, then I discipline them to teach them, don't go into the street. Why? Not because I don't like my kids. No, because I love my kids. And so we have a world that wants to hold everything relative and truth with it. But we find in Scripture that truth is not relative. We do have the truth. And so love says we rejoice with this truth. Now, remember that Ravi Zacharias quote earlier, where we need to speak the truth in love. If we don't do that, then the words we say don't have the effect they need to have. But we do need to hold on to truth. So with these things in mind, let's read through 1 Corinthians 4 through 8. And as I do, I want you to think through these words. And first, be a little self-evaluative. Think, are there any ways that I haven't been all that loving this week? Are there any ways I need God to work in my life right now? Are there things that I need to pray and ask God to help to develop in me? So think and pray through those as I read through this passage slowly. Love is patient and kind. 
Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. I'm going to read it for you in a different translation. I find sometimes different words strike our hearts in different ways. This one's a translation that David Garland put in his commentary. Again, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not filled up with jealousy. It is not vainglorious. It is not puffed up. It does not behave indecently. It does not seek its own advantage. It is not cantankerous. It does not keep a score of wrongs. It does not rejoice over injustice, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now I want us to go through this one more time, but this time, use it a way to remember ways God has brought about love in your life. Use it a way to celebrate the ways that God has helped you to love in ways that are not normal, are not usual, are not really how you would normally respond in a situation. And celebrate those as I read. Once again, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It's not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It's not, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. That's the hope we have. These descriptions of love are action words. Love is not just this feeling we have, but is the way we live out our lives. And not on our own, by the way, right? It's God working in and through each and every one of us. So as I look around the world and I look at the situation, it seems like life's crazier now than it's been in a while, right? So what's the answer? The answer is love. The answer is the love that can only come from God. The love that had Jesus die on the cross for our sins and raise again. It's a love that's changed my life. Your presence here today, I believe, is the love that's changed your life. And if it's changed our lives, then it can change our community. It can change our country. And it can change our world. So we need to go and show and share the love of Jesus this week. Faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. You pray with me. Heavenly Father, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve the great love that you have for us. No, to be honest, Lord, we don't even understand it. After all that we have done, after all that we have turned away from you, you still love us. So much so that you sent Jesus, fully God and fully man, to come and to die on our behalf. And Father, may we be overcome by your love this morning. And Lord, as we've experienced your love, may we go and share and show that love to others. Be with us this week. Help us to love this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you don't know the love of Jesus, if you don't know a God who's loved you so much that he died on the cross for you, we'd love for you to come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning. Or if you're looking for a church family, a church to come and join, uh, from what I've been told uh, and what I've noticed so far, this is a loving, wonderful church to be a part of. Uh, if you just need somebody to pray with, uh, Pastor Matt's going to be here. He's going to 
be here to welcome you, to help you join, to help you uh, know how to become a Christian, uh, to pray with you. Uh, So come as we listen to this music this morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. So at this time, we're going to go into church conference. We're going to have a business meeting. So we'll ask uh, Chad and Lori and their family to uh, dismiss them. Thank you, Chad, for the message. Thank you, Lori. (laughs) And Ryan and Della and Sawyer and David, thanks for joining us today. So church conference is for members, so what we're going to do today is um, the committee has nominated Chad Bertrand to be our next pastor, so as it comes from a committee, we've got, that serves as a, a motion and a second, so we're going to hold a vote today because we are also uh, having service remotely, we're going to allow people a couple of different ways to vote. So um, if you'll look in your pew there, there are some paper ballots that you can use. Um, What you will do is there's two choices on there. Select your choice prayerfully. Now, as I said, this is for members. If you're not a member, um, just bear with us a few minutes, and then we'll all be dismissed. If you're at home uh, watching on uh, live stream, you'll have a chance to vote uh, other ways as well. So... If you're here in the church and you want to use the ballot, put your answer, and as you leave, you can drop it in the giving boxes in the lobby. The other three methods, and you can use those as well, just remember we're only voting one way, right? Um, just, just choose one and vote. If you're um, not comfortable using the paper ballot, you can use the other three methods. So Shandar has set up um, a QR code. There's some posted at the back of the sanctuary and on the doors leaving the lobby. You can scan that with your smartphone, and that'll allow you to vote that way. Uh, A third method, and we have the QR code posted as well. A third method is we've set up an email. It's called pastorvote at gmail.com. You can email there starting now um, through 4 p.m., tomorrow. And then lastly, if you're not comfortable with any of those methods or you don't have email and you'd like to phone in, you can call the church office anytime tomorrow from 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. And I believe the church number is on that second slide. Um, Be patient if you call and they don't answer. They may be talking with someone else. But there's the number, 281-331-3000. 
1-800-273-3902. Um, one of the ladies that answers the phones will ask your name, and, and then they'll ask you for your decision. One way that, So I ask you to prayerfully consider. Um, likewise, if you look in your pew and you don't see a ballot, I have a couple of guys in the back, a couple of ushers that have ballots, just raise your hand and they'll bring you one as well. Okay, everybody, under, at least everyone here, understand what we need to do, right? So we're, gonna, we're voting on a decision to call Chad Bertrand as our next pastor. All right, thank you. I'm going to let Shandar close us with prayer. prayed for blessing we prayed for strength comfort for family protection while we sleep we prayed for healing for prosperity we prayed for your mighty hand to ease our suffering for all the while you hear each spoken need yet love is way too much to give us lesser things cause what if your blessings come through raindrops what if your healing comes through tears what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom voice to hear and we cry in anger when we cannot feel you near we doubt your goodness we doubt your love as if 